Welcome to the Brave Church Podcast. Our hope is that this message will encourage and inspire you in your walk with Jesus and help you move forward in the life that you're meant to live. Amen. We're going um, to dive into the book of Luke today in full transparency. Today's message is one that I preached almost a year ago during uh, what we called our preview services. So this church was launched uh, last September, but leading up to it, we did about four soft launch services in which we talked about things that our church really, 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 really think are important to this community. And this message is one of those previous services. So with that, if you were one of the 17 people that were here for that service, I apologize that this will be your second time. Let me say it this way. If you are one of those 17 people that were here for that service and you have already perfected what we are going to talk about, you don't need to hear it again. I am sorry. Have patience for the rest of us as we try to get closer to God. We're going to the book of Luke. We're going to check out a a conversation between Jesus and an expert in the Jewish law. Here's what it says. One day, an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. That should already tell you a lot about this guy's perspective. But he's got a shot to talk to the the Son of God, Jesus, and his approach is to try to test Jesus. Jesus is is trying to prove who Jesus is uh, by coming up with a question to debunk what Jesus has been talking about. And he says this, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? And how do you read it? Stick with that. What does the law of Moses say? And how do you read that? I love that. That could be a whole message right there just on those two questions. Because Jesus doesn't just say, well, I ask, what does the law of Moses say he asked the man how do you read it because how many y'all know there's a difference between what is said and and what you hear what you read all my wives in the house know there's a difference between what you said to your husband and what your husband actually heard you say there is a difference between what we experience and how we interpret our experiences. There is a difference between the problems in our lives and how we perceive the problems in our lives. And one of the advantages to walking in faith is not that it frees us from what other people experience, but it gives us the key to how to interpret what we're experiencing. So while our circumstances might say that you're down and out, faith in Christ will allow you to see that you're still in it. While, while your mind might say that you've got nothing left to give and that you are no longer fit to lead your family, faith in Christ will help you see that God is just getting started. While others might say that, that, that you don't have what it takes and while your emotions might agree with them, faith in Christ will help you see your situation differently. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, what does this say? And then ask them, but how do you read it? How do you read it? And so the man responds to Jesus in verse 27. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. And, all, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, right, do this and you'll live. Which at this point, like, it's just kind of comical. Like, those are the only two things that you've got to do. Just do those perfectly. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is like, yeah, you go do that try see how that goes for you and so then the man because he wants to justify his actions he asks Jesus and who is my neighbor to which Jesus launches into a story and he says that there was a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits and they stripped him of his clothing they beat him up and they left him half dead beside the road but there was good news there was a priest coming along a Jewish priest Jewish rabbi This is an expert in the moral law, the rules and the regulations. When the priest saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. But then a temple assistant walked over. This is a Levite, a Jewish Levite, and he looked at the man lying there. It also says that he went over to the man and he looked at them, but he also passed by on the other side. But then a despised Samaritan came along And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he took him to an inn where he took care of him there. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time that I come back. 
Now, which of these, Jesus asked, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Today, I wanna talk about the levels of connection. We are a church that likes connecting. And so before you're seated, would you be brave enough to high five five people around you, preferably five people that you don't necessarily know all that well. Some of y'all the only person in your row. This shouldn't be hard. Just find someone else. High five five people and ask them, are you connected? High five five people before you're seated and ask them, are you connected? And then you can be seated. And then as you are getting seated, let's give it up for our worship team today. Come on, thank them. 15% of the room is grateful for our worship team today. Can we thank our worship team for leading us? Can we thank the media team? Can we thank the kids leaders back there that are spraying your kids with water and they're having a grand old time? John Judah is going to be, he's going to be soaking wet when he gets in the car, praying that in Jesus' name. <laughs> so uh, we were about three weeks into our marriage when I started to get concerned about my, my wives, um, my, not my wives as in plural, wife, wife apostrophe S. I need to punctuate that correctly so as not to lead this message into a direction that I do not want to go in. Um, we were about three weeks married when I started to wonder about my wife Jackie's um, mental state. Uh, because um, she had never shown the signs of, of memory loss or inattention. Um, but after about three weeks, I started to wonder if the emotion and the, the rush of adrenaline from our wedding day had gotten to her, her mindset and her mental uh, faculties. Let me explain. About three weeks into our marriage, um, you know, we got married and, and we moved in with each other. And um, I would get home from work and I would go through my get home from work routine, which typically involved me kicking off my shoes, one to the right, one to the left. I might grab a, a cool soda pop um, from the fridge and make my way directly to the uh, couch, turn on the TV and catch some scores. Amen. Got some, some husbands nodding with me. Um, and, and the first time this happened, I, I didn't. I wasn't concerned. The first time that this happened, I, she walked in and she was holding my shoes and she looked at me and she asked me this question and this is exactly how she asked it. She said, now where do these go? Now, I wasn't concerned. I, I thought she must not know. And so being the, the good new husband that I am, I just looked at her and smiled and said, let me show you. And, and I took my shoes and, and I showed her right here. This is where you can place those. And I grew concerned the next day when I went through my get home from work routine. And she came back in holding my shoes yet again and wondering, where did these go? And at that moment, I started to wonder if something was wrong. Because I felt like I just showed you yesterday where you could put these. And, and my concern grew, my concern grew when I, 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 you know, got home from basketball that, that night and I threw my basketball bag on the kitchen table. She came in wondering the same question, where does this go? My concern grew even more when she started asking about the dirty dishes in the sink. Where did these, where does this go? I grew concerned until, um, come to find out, I was very surprised that she was not looking for new information. She made it very clear to me that she was not asking to be enlightened. Come to find out, my wife had already made up her mind on where those things were supposed to be. She had already made up her mind on where my shoes and my jacket and my basketball uh, stuff and, and where the dishes were supposed to be located. Come to find out that she was asking a rhetorical question. Took me three weeks to figure that one out, y'all. I'm a slow learner. And, and that rhetorical question that she, she asked way back then that we've moved on from, and I'm very grateful that today we have a strong marriage. It made us stronger, y'all, what we've been through. That made us who we are today. Um, that rhetorical question got me thinking um, how sometimes it's that type of rhetorical question that can keep us from experiencing God and his will for our life. Because have, have you ever asked God about something in your life when in fact you had already made up your mind on what his response was going to be? 
Have you ever asked God, God, what's your direction for, for my life? When you had already made up, your, you had already decided the direction that you were going to go in. Have you ever asked God for his will? God, what's your will for my life? But really, you already knew what you wanted his will to be in your life, and you moved on your will, calling it his will, and then things didn't work out, things didn't pan out, and you got upset with God because his will was obviously not working, but it really had nothing to do with his will. It was your will, and when you ask him for his will, what you were really just trying to do was affirm what you were already going to do from the start. Anyone with me? Anyone ever tried to move forward on an assumption only to find that your assumption was misaligned with who God is and who God wanted you to be? Got one hand in the place, one brave soul. Well, if you are like me, and that's you, you probably find yourself relating to this expert in the Jewish law that is chatting with Jesus, which um, just a, a forecast for this message, we're going to teach a little bit today, all right? So buckle up, we're going to go into the classroom. The expert in the law, as he's ta uh, talking with Jesus, it becomes very clear that this man is not looking for new information as he is asking Jesus these questions. He's not looking to be enlightened. He's not asking for Jesus to, to show him how to live the life that he's meant to live, but rather it becomes very clear that this man is looking for his assumptions to be affirmed. He's looking, he, he's looking for his current thinking to be confirmed by what Jesus says. It becomes very clear that, that he's looking for his assumption about loving other people to be affirmed by what Jesus says. It becomes very clear that he's not looking for new information, but he's looking for Jesus to affirm what he has always assumed about connection. You can almost hear it in his voice. As he, as he asked Jesus in verse 29, you can almost hear the, the tone of Jackie in his voice. And who's my neighbor? Jesus has just confirmed that, yes, you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, yes, love your neighbor at yourself. Good luck with that. Right then and there, that man should have gotten the hint that, that that's, a, that's tough. That's a hard thing to do. Has anyone ever struggled in this room with loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, all of your strength? And has anyone ever struggled to love your neighbor just like you love yourself? But that man didn't get the cue. He should have gotten the cue. He should have gotten when Jesus said, yeah, go do that. Because that's the thing about Jesus is sometimes, sometimes he'll, say, he'll tell you, go try it. Go try it. Go see how that works. This isn't our strange phrase uh, for, for the day. But one of the, the things that, that can be a powerful tool in our vocabulary is when we say, I can't do that. Because only when you realize what you can't do can you experience what Jesus is able to do. Right then and there, the man should have looked at Jesus. Man, that's really hard. I don't think I can do that. But he said, okay. And he goes on to affirm what he's always assumed. And he looks at Jesus and he asks him, and who's my neighbor? Because he assumes that he's been killing it in loving his neighbors. He thinks that he's gotten this one down. Largely because this man, as he uses the, the Greek word for neighbor, it, it, the definition simply means one who is close to you. One who is near. Your neighbor. And he thinks that he's got that down because he's been loving the people that are in his circle. The people who are near to him. Because back in those days, if you didn't like someone, you didn't do life with them. Back in those days, if you had differences with someone, you, you didn't break bread with them. If you didn't get along, if you disagreed with people, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't run in that circle. Back in those days, you know, I guess you could call back in those days, things were really segregated. Back in those days. Back in those days. As if things have changed. And this man thinks, I've got it. I'm loving people close to me. I'm loving people in my close circle. Because to him, the definition of neighbor was safe and sound within a very sanitized and stationary environment. And yet that's exactly what Jesus confronts within the first few words 
of his story. Jesus launches into a story in verse 30 by saying a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. This is interesting. The man asked him, who is my neighbor? But Jesus, instead of giving the man a Merriam-Webster textbook answer, Jesus launches into a story that takes the man from the very comfortable context of his own preferences and proclivities, and Jesus takes the man out onto the road, gets him out into a journey. He takes the man out, out on the way because how many of y'all know life doesn't happen when you stay put where you're at, but life starts to hit you upside the face when you're on the way somewhere. Life doesn't hit you when, when you stay stuck, but life will hit you when you start to move forward. We talked, this, uh, talked about this briefly last week. One of the best ways for outing the, the devil in your life is by trying to, stay, to, trying to take a step forward in the life that you're meant to live. And I think you'd agree that life can certainly be let down free if your life is free from any sort of leaps, any sort of transitions, any sort of steps. And yeah, you can guard your heart from hurt. You can go your whole life without getting hurt, your heart hurt, as long as you keep your heart from loving anyone. You, you, can, you can rid your life from all of the opposition as long as you don't move forward. But how many of y'all know that when you try to get from point A to B, life starts to happen? When, 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 you, when you start to try to get closer to God, all of a sudden, life starts to happen and those thoughts that you need to be a theologian in order to know God because you, you busted open your little you version on your, app, on your phone, the little you version app to read the Bible. And poof, you didn't have any doubts about experiencing God, but now you do. Life starts to happen when you start to work on your marriage, doesn't it? It was chill and it was cool and it was kind of easy as long as you, you didn't allow yourself to look at the areas of growth. But now that you did, life starts to happen. Foreclosure starts to happen. Heartache starts to happen. Life happens on the way. But what Jesus is about to illustrate, and this is a powerful illustration, that, that the thing that often disconnects us is not the fact that life happens to us. But often the reason for our disconnection in this world is the fact that life doesn't always happen at the same time to us. And, and what you're going through is not necessarily what your best friend is going through at that certain point in time. Life happens to all of us, but here's the key difference is that life doesn't always happen in the same way to each of us. Because there's some things that you've been through that I've never been through. And there's some things that, that I've experienced that you've never experienced in your life. And so many times, the greatest threat to our connection is the disconnection of our experiences. And we see this in the first man that approaches the injured Jewish man on the side of the road. It looks like good news, Jesus says, because there's a priest. There's a pastor coming. There's a Jewish rabbi. Again, this is a picture of the moral law. The rabbi would have been an expert in the rules and the regulations. This, this guy knew all about God, and he knew all about how to maintain right standing with God. And yet Jesus says that when the priest got up there, he saw the man lying there, verse 31, and he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. I've got three points for us today, and they're each a level of connection, and this is the first one. The priest is a picture of our first level of connection, which is known as apathy. Apathy. The language of apathy is, I know, I just don't care. I see it, but it doesn't matter. Nothing brings out the apathetic spirit, a little comic relief here. Nothing brings out the apathetic spirit in me like running through a Taco Bell drive through at 10 o'clock at night. I know this isn't wisdom, but I don't care. I know the, the Taco 12-pack is supposed to serve four people. I know, but I don't care. It will just be serving me. Thank you. I know... But I don't care. It's when there is awareness, but a lack of attention. 
In his book, Hashtag Struggles, Pastor Craig Rochelle talks about how we as a society are becoming more and more desensitized as a result of the amount of information and awareness that we are forcing our brain to process, largely due to, I bet you can guess what it is, it's not the newspaper, it's not the books you read, but it's social media. Because the social media experience, depending upon who you're following, within 20 seconds, you, you will be forcing your brain to try to process 10 to 15 different things that are happening in our world. And in 20 seconds, your mind will be trying, you know, will be ooing and aahing over the picture of your nieces and nephews. Oh, my gosh. Swipe. And then you're laughing because of the new, you know, viral cat video that just came out. Oh, my gosh. Look at that cat. And all of a sudden, you're grimacing because news just came out about the most recent mass shooting. And so our brains, because they're incredible tools, our brains, because they're built to run very efficiently, um, our brains will try to level out the emotional experience over time. That as we continue to do that, as we continue to poof, cat videos, poof, nephews, poof, mass shooting, our brain, if we keep doing that, our brain will try to level out the emotional experience where now it'll try to find a happy medium in between being ha 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 over the cat video to grimacing at the loss of life. And the surplus of information and awareness is desensitizing us. It's interesting that Jesus says that the priest saw, he saw the man there, beaten and bloody, but he just passed on by. It makes me think about how it's never been easier to just swipe on by the issues in our country. It has never been easier just to swipe on by the hurting people in our lives. It's never been easier just to, just to <laughs> swipe on by. The language of apathy is that I, I know I just don't care. The language of apathy is I, I know, but as long as it doesn't impact me, it does not matter to me. That's apathy. But then Jesus continues on to this story. And, uh, and again, it looks like good news because he mentions that there is another great candidate on the way, which was a temple assistant known as a Levite. The Levite is a picture of the ceremonial law. The, the Levite would have been an expert in the customs and the practices of, of the Jews, how they were supposed to rest on the Sabbath, how they were supposed to eat, how they were supposed to, to dress. Um, he, he would know all about all the sacrifices that they were to perform back then in order to regain right standing with God. And it would yet a, a appear again that this is a prime prospect, yet another person, another good Christian on the way, another person who knows God, knows how to connect with God, and yet Jesus says in verse 32 that the Levite walked over and he looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Whereas the rabbi saw the man on the other side of the road and he just swiped on by, he just passed by, the Levite sees the man on the opposite side of the road, he walks over to the man, he looks at the man, and then he moves on. This is a picture of our second level of co connection called sympathy. Everyone go, aw. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm so sorry. This is sympathy. The language of sympathy is I know and I kind of care, but not enough to care for you. I know, man, that's tough. And I care in my heart, I really do, I felt something, but not enough to actually do something about it. One of my favorite authors, I've mentioned her many times, she's a leading expert in vulnerability and human connection. Her name is uh, Brene Brown. She sums up sympathy by saying that sympathy is when you're in a low, dark place and someone might even, they might shout down from above and say, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Good luck. Or, or, or sympathy is when you're in a low, dark place and someone might come down and say, this is rough. I hope you get yourself out of this mess. I'll be at the top waiting for you. I know and I care, but not enough to care for you. And, and let me point out that sympathy is not bad. 
I'm not trying to put Hallmark out of business with their sympathy cards. Personally, if you're going to give me a sympathy card, I do notice the different types of cards, and I would like a papyrus card. If you all know what I'm talking about, you're going to be running about eight bucks for that, but I'll know that you really care for me. I appreciate a good sympathy card when I'm going through a low place. I appreciate a nice, sympathetic text. But how many of y'all know that there's a difference between getting a sympathy card or a sympathetic text from your coworker and, and getting one from your husband because he does not want to connect with you in your misery? Like, like can you all imagine the repercussions I, I would face if I knew Jackie, my wife, was going through a really hard time, a really bad day, and I texted her and I said, babe, so sorry to hear that you're going through this. So sorry. I know it's rough. P.S. Gonna be hanging out with the boys tonight. I'll be home late. I'll see you tomorrow. Hugs and kisses. XOXO. See you tomorrow. Love you. Bye-bye. And it's not, it's not that it's bad. It's not that it's wrong. It's just that sympathy is oftentimes incomplete. Because while there is a connection, it lacks an action. It's void of any action that can actually make a difference. Sympathy says, I know, and I care, but not enough to care for you, which leads us to our third and final level of connection. And this is where the story takes an odd turn. Because after the two prime prospects pass by, the Jewish priest and the Levite, the most unlikely candidate approaches, and in verse 33, Jesus says that a despised Samaritan comes along. And when the Samaritan saw the man, he felt compassion for him. And going over to the man, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. And he put the man on his own donkey, and he took him to an inn where he took care of him. And at this point, when, 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 the, when Jesus mentioned the Samaritan and what the Samaritan did for the Jewish man in the story, um, every, uh, from what we know, um, this Jewish man's jaw must have dropped. Because while he might have expected, yeah, man, that's a rough go. The rabbi probably should have helped you out. Yeah, the Levi, yeah, he probably should have. This was completely unexpected to, to the Jewish expert in the law. Because he was not thinking that this story was going to take a twist by a Samaritan helping out the Jewish man. Because back then, let's just say it this way, the, the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. In fact, it's safe to say that they hated each other. You want to talk about race relations? This was a race thing. The Jews considered the Samaritans half-breeds. The Jews hated the Samaritans so much, in fact, that many times when Jews would be going from Galilee to Jerusalem or from Jerusalem down to Galilee, um, they, they would, instead of going Samaria, which through Samaria where the Samaritans were, you probably figured that one out, the Jews oftentimes would take, take days to go around just so that they could avoid associating with the Samaritans. They'd, ta they'd take a different freeway just so they didn't have to drive through. They, they, they would, they'd, you know, when Google Maps gives you alternate routes, nope, not that one. 15 minutes instead of 10, I'll take the long way around. Just so that they couldn't associate with those despised Samaritans. This was a race thing. This was a beliefs thing. This was a, a you're not like me, and so therefore I don't like you type of thing. And yet Jesus in his story says that it was the Samaritan who, even though he knew that this Jewish man hated his guts, it was the Samaritan that tended to the Jewish man's wounds. It was the Samaritan who, knowing that the man, the Jewish man, would probably never return the favor, picked the man up, put him on his donkey, and carried him to safety. It was the Samaritan, knowing that this Jewish man would likely never pay him back. He leaves money with the innkeeper and tells the innkeeper that if there's any other charges on the man's account, that he would take care of those two it was the Samaritan who was willing to overcome his apathetic tendencies. Because you better believe in that Samaritan's heart. He must have been thinking, I know, but I don't care about you. It was the Samaritan who was willing to push past the limits of sympathy. It was the Samaritan who illustrates what we as the church are called to do. What Jesus is emphasizing here as he empathizes with the broken and beaten Jewish man on the side of the road 
This is our third level of connection, and it's known as empathy. Would you say that with me? Empathy. Empathy. The language of empathy is, I care about you, and I'll care for you even if it costs me. You ever had someone empathize with you? The language of empathy is, I don't know what you're going through, but I'd like to know. Even if it costs me my assumptions about what you're going through. The language of empathy is, is I know we don't have the same experiences, but I'd like to step into your experience, even if it's going to cost me some comfort, even if it's going to cost me some convenience. Y'all ready for our strange phrase for the week? Nod your head if you're with me. It's the strangest phrase of them all. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the strangest phrase of them all? Here's what empathy says. Empathy says, I don't know, but I can imagine. I can imagine. Say it with me. I can imagine. I can imagine. The key to empathizing with each other comes down to our willingness to imagine someone else's experience. I can imagine. No, I haven't gone through what you're going through, but I can imagine. I can imagine. No, no I, I don't know what you're feeling, but I can imagine because I think I felt something similar to that. I can imagine. No, I don't know what it's like to be where you're at. I don't know what it's like to be broken, beaten on the side of the road, to be left for dead. I don't know what it's like to be left by, 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 by two guys that, I, man, I, I saw them approaching. I thought they'd help you out. I don't know what that's like, but I can imagine what, it's like, what it might be like to be there. And I can imagine that I probably want someone to help me out. I can imagine. I've never had that happen to me. But I can imagine how hurtful that must have been and how that must, must like have changed the way that you see the world. I can imagine. I can imagine. And y'all, I really do believe that this might be the strangest phrase that we've had this entire series. Because if you're anything like me, I bet you've said the exact opposite when facing a situation that you've never gone through yourself. And maybe I'll just be the first one to be transparent because I know that there have been times when I've watched people mess up their life and the first thing that's come out of my mouth has been, I can't imagine. I, ca I can't imagine. They've got kids. I, I can't imagine doing something like that. I, didn't they think about their family? I mean, I, I can't imagine, or when someone struggles with something that I've never struggled with, <laughs> I can't imagine. Can't imagine struggling with that. Can't imagine dealing with that. Can't imagine, ooh, man, I, I mean, I, all I'm saying is that, is that I can't imagine, and in full transparency, this is a message that was born out of conviction that I really felt like God walked me through a few years ago, where that was like my, that was my, my default response to things that I couldn't relate to, was I can't imagine, I can't imagine, I can't imagine, I can't imagine, until finally I felt like God, maybe it wasn't God, maybe it was my only mind, but I really felt like this is what God was working in me. Finally, I felt like God asked me, really? You can't imagine? Really, with all the other things that you can just poof, imagine in your mind out of thin air, you can't imagine how they got to that point. With all, I seen what you imagine. It ain't all good, little Jacob. And yet, all of a sudden, your imagination station is turned off. Huh? Really? You can't imagine, or is it that you, your little phrase "I can't imagine" is a cop out for connection? Because I don't know about you, but I found out that as long as I can't imagine what you're going through, I won't feel compelled to connect with you. That as long as, as, long as I, 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 I can't imagine what you're feeling, I can't imagine what you're feeling right now. I can guard my feelings and I can stay happy. I, I, I can have, still have a good day. Because I can't imagine what you'd be feeling right now. And I, I can keep my comfort zone intact. Because, I mean, there's no reason for both of us to have a bad day. Well, that's funny because Paul says in Romans 8 that we're not only supposed to rejoice with each other, but we're also supposed to mourn with each other as well. But I really don't want to connect to you in your misery, so I'm just going to say that I can't imagine. 
I can't imagine. I can't imagine, you know, I can't imagine what you're struggling with. And as long as I can, as long as I can't imagine, maybe this is just me, y'all. But as long as I can't imagine what you're struggling with, you know what? I can continue thinking that, I mean, I, 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 I might be just a little bit better than you because I can't even imagine struggling with that. You've struggled with that for 15 years. I can't imagine that. And I, and I, can, and I can keep myself safe. And I can keep thinking that, you know what, maybe I'm just further along because I don't struggle with that kind of stuff. As long as I can't imagine what you're experiencing, I will have no reason to empathize with you. Lean in for this church. But when our response is, I can imagine, and when we stop for a second and we use that beautiful brain that you've got, just stop for a second. And even though everything in you, in the survivalist mindset that you've got is saying, don't imagine, don't imagine, don't imagine, don't imagine, because then you'll connect. Then you might have to act on that. Did you see what the, what the Samaritan, it said that he felt compassion for the man. And that's what compelled him to act. When we begin to imagine, because if I can imagine, if I can imagine that, then that will help cue me in onto what you might need in this moment. If I can imagine what you're feeling right now, maybe that's the space, maybe that will give me the capacity to speak what you need to hear in this moment. If I, if I can imagine what that must be like, maybe that will draw me into true connection. Maybe that will provide me with the power to empathize with you. Check this out, church, because not only is this a story uh, uh, about, about how we connect with each other, but really this is a story that gives us the target. This is the story that sets the precedent and the example for one who is able to, to connect with us. This is not just a story on how to, we're to love our neighbor, but this is a story about how Jesus was willing to connect with us. Because watch this. The priest is a picture of the moral law, the rules and the regulations, the do's and the don'ts. That was, that was one part of the Old Testament law. The Levite is a picture of the, the, the ceremonial laws, the customs and the traditions. That was another part of the Old Testament law. And yet, neither the priest or the Levite pulled over and saved the man's life. And neither the ceremonial law or, 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 or the moral law was able to save humanity from our broken and beaten down selves. Because Paul said in Romans as well, he said that the law, it was good. We talked about this last week. It was good for pointing out our flaws. It was good at pointing out our weaknesses, but it, did, it lacked the power to save us. And yet here comes this Samaritan who was willing to step over his differences, a Samaritan who was willing to surrender his comfort in order to, to connect. It was the Samaritan, the Samaritan who, who was willing to pull over. It was the, will, the willingness to pay the price. You see, y'all, the, the Samaritan is a picture of Jesus, that while the moral law and the ceremonial laws were unable to save us, the good news of the gospel of Christ is that there was still a third person on the way. There was, there was still a third person, I'll, I'll say it this way, there was still a third person who was willing to cross over. There was an unlikely candidate who was willing to step down from his heavenly perfection and step into a world that wanted nothing to do with him. There was a third person. There was a third option. There was a, there was a Samaritan. The Samaritan is a picture of Jesus who saw us on the road, side of the road, broken down by our sin, still locked up in our hopelessness. It was the Samaritan, the picture of Jesus, the Son of God, grace in flesh, who chose to cross over, pick us up, and carry us on his back. If you're looking for a picture of empathy, y'all, Jesus is it. And I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for, for the type of God that doesn't just speak over my life, but he was willing to step into my life. I'm so thankful for, for the Son of God who, who not only sympathizes with me and he was not only sorry about my situation, but he empathizes with us. One of the most powerful verses I really think it is, one of the most powerful verses, at least in my life right now, is to know in Hebrews 4.15, that we don't have a high priest 
who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but rather we have a high priest who is willing to face and endure and experience everything that we have ever faced all so that he could look us, look at us and say, I can imagine that we have Jesus who is willing that no matter how you feel about what you're going through, he's able to look at you and say, I can imagine that because I've been there. To know that Jesus, no matter what you might be struggling with, we have Jesus, a high priest, who's willing to empathize with us and say, I, 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 know, how that, I know how that must be. Because I'm, I'm so thankful for Jesus, the Son of God, who not only is willing to empathize with us, but as Hebrews says, he was willing to overcome it. So that when Jesus steps into our situation, he gives us the grace and the power to overcome what we're going through. And it's because of this brave church. It's because of what Jesus did for us. And it's because of the grace that he wrapped us up in that we are not only able, but as Jesus said in verse 37, that now we should do the same for others. So let's get uncomfortably practical as we close this message. Let's get uncomfortably practical with a question that says, because of what Jesus did to empathize with you and me, here's the question. Who does Jesus want you to connect to? Who's Jesus calling to you to start empathizing with? Now, now I know that sometimes when, when we hear a message like this, we think we try to mask, um, we try to mask where, where God is really pointing us, the direction that God is really directing us in, and we try to mask it with drama. And so, um, and listen, God bless, and this is, we need to take care of the needy and the broken in our city, absolutely. And if God convicts you about the person that's standing on the corner with the sign, amen to that. But don't let that cover up the people that are right inside your neighborhood, right inside your workplace, that Jesus is pointing and said, connect with them. Let's get even more uncomfortable. We'll, we're all in this together, we're all growing together. Here's a few things that'll help you cue you in on who God is, wants you to connect with. Look at the story of the Samaritan. Best way to, to know who God wants you to connect with, um, look for the differences. Look for the differences that we typically allow to divide us. Whether it's whether it's uh, religious backgrounds, and for some reason, some of us Christians think that it is our it is okay to disconnect with people just because because they well they don't believe what we believe. I love what Rabbi Zachariah said in our call. Read he said, um, "Building a bridge does not require you to give up ground. Building a bridge does not require you to give up ground, and yet we are just so afraid that if we connect to people that believe something differently, that that all of a sudden we're like our faith is going to get stolen." Religious differences, color of our skin, socioeconomic differences, viewpoints, political preferences. Man, I don't know if you're like me. When if, if I start looking at my life through that, there's a there's a world of people that God's calling me to connect with. And so with that, will you pray with me as we ask for God's grace to help us in that? Let's pray today as we close. Father, thank you. Thank you, God, that you not only give us a difficult word like this, but you also provide us with the grace and the power to move on it. Now, what, what the enemy will try to convince us in this second is that we've got to get this figured out and we've got to be perfect in this this week. Otherwise, don't try at all. But we know that your word does not, does not um, require us to be perfect, but you call us towards progress. And so today, God, we ask that this would be a week where we would take some ground in empathizing with the people around us. That we would take some ground on building some bridges with people that we, for whatever reason, we've been excusing it. God, that this would be a week that this church would leave these doors 
and something would shift in their workplace. Something would shift in their families. Something would shift in their mindset. And all of a sudden, instead of seeing cues for disconnection, we're starting to see signals for, for empathy, signals for stepping in and asking people. We're starting to see the broken and the hurt people. And rather than saying, I can't imagine in order to protect our personal convenience, we're saying, I can imagine. That must be tough. And so now allow me to join you in that. If you enjoy listening to the Brave Church podcast and think others could too, please rate us wherever you're listening and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you'd like to support Brave Church financially, you can do that by going to bravechurch.tv give.